killing me, dude. All right, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out to this talk. It's called Secrets and Shadows, Leveraging Big Data for Vulnerability Discovery at Scale. I'm so excited to be here for another year at another DEF CON, and I really do have something in store for you today. Let's get right into it. So just a disclaimer, everything we're going to talk about today was done completely independent of my employer, outside of work, with my own money, my own resources. Um, if you want to talk about this work outside of this presentation, just please refer to me as an independent security researcher. It helps me be able to do work just like this. So my name is Bill Dimmerkuppa, and I am a security researcher who, with a diverse background in low-level software security and also cloud security. Uh, can we boost the mic a bit? Um, I'm interested in defense and offense. I love ha solving hard security problems. And while I do, while I did start with a software security background, I feel like the impact we can have with cloud security is much wider. For example, you could have the most complex software vulnerability in the world, but at the end of the day, a simple ID check or missing ID check in a cloud environment can lead to a much broader impact. And that's what really got me interested in the cloud. It's the ability to have an impact without the same technical complexity that comes with exploiting low-level vulnerabilities. So in this talk, we're going to discuss vulnerability discovery at scale. And what I mean by that is we're going to take a look at how we traditionally approach vulnerability discovery with two common bug classes, dangling cloud resources and leaked secrets. The goal is to identify the limitations of our historical approach and shift our perspective through some practical examples. So some background. Now, from a high level, everyone knows what cloud computing is. It, it's basically a way where you can create infrastructure like servers, websites, and more without needing to actually purchase your own physical server rack. The cool part is this can save you a lot of money. If you're just creating your own blog, you really don't need that many resources at all. Why not borrow someone else's? And that's really the fundamental principle of cloud computing. All you're doing is borrowing from someone else's pool of shared resources. So cloud environments are managed over the internet, but how do we actually secure this access? Well, for AWS, the way it works is that you can use something called an access key. An access key can be short-lived or long-term token that specifies credentials for your account and allows you to manage your AWS resources depending on the role and permissions assigned to you. Can we uh, please increase the microphone sound? And for other platforms, it's similar. For example, for Google Cloud, the types of authentication include service accounts, you can use CLI credentials, and in general, tokens are how we're able to operate with these cloud environments. Unfortunately, tokens also present a pretty severe risk. So cloud provider tokens are dangerous because by default, little restriction, there's little restriction on who can use those tokens. For example, by default, if you create a root access key in AWS, anyone from any IP can use that access key to manage your cloud environment. Now, obviously, the impact of a leaked cloud credential will really depend on the context. For example, a lot of websites hard code a Google Maps API key, and in reality, despite the fact that it can lead to billing overcharges and abuse, the impact is still fairly limited. But with a root AWS key, the dangers are much more problematic. For example, if you store your database in AWS or you store your computing in AWS, an attacker could use your credentials to not only access customer data, but to interfere with your production workflows. Now, when we talk about how everything in the cloud is shared and borrowed, what I mean by that is by nature, by its nature, 
the cloud model introduces risk from this sharing model. So for example, when you create a virtual machine, what's really happening is you're borrowing time on a physical server that your cloud provider has bought. And, and on this physical resource, you get, a, you get assigned a network IP, for example. And the reason this is dangerous is because once you're done with a resource, if you still have dangling DNS records pointing at that resource, suddenly that exposes an opportunity for an attacker to take advantage of. So from a high level, I view cloud resources in two categories, primitive resources and shared resources. So a primitive resource is something like a virtual machine where you get assigned a dedicated IP address. That IP address is not used by any other customer but you. Whereas with a shared resource, what's really going on is it's a serverless application that serves multiple customers. For example, if you have a serverless function that you can call on your cloud provider, that URL you use to connect to that serverless function probably corresponds to an IP that serves a lot of other customers. The reason this distinction is important is because it impacts what type of dangling DNS records you need to worry about. So for primitive resources where you have that unique IP address, that includes pretty much every type of DNS record that could be dangling, like an A record, a C name record, a name server, and et cetera. But whereas if it's a shared resource where the endpoint is shared across customers, that's gonna be limited to C names, um, name server, MX, those types of records. And the distinction there is that when the endpoint is shared, suddenly you don't have to worry about the A record pointing at an a IP address you no longer control. So what can an attacker do with that domain control? Well, from a high level, it can enable phishing, malware distribution, scams, et cetera. It can lead to cross-site scripting. Uh, and there's going to be context-specific impact, like you can bypass the trusted host names check in a software update installer. That's something I've seen pretty common. You can abuse the brand trust and reputation in order to spread misinformation. Now, I included a quote below from APNIC on an article talking about this potential abuse. So from a high level, they found that when it came to dangling DNS record abuse, um, in general, 75% of the hijacked dangling resources were being used to, for black hat search engine optimization and really promoting bad websites you don't want anyone going to. So, to be clear, past approaches for these types of bugs already exist. Where with dangling cloud resources, you know, we've seen that attackers can go ahead and enumerate cloud IP pools and capture these resources that are dangling. But with leak secrets, what we've seen is that a lot of work really relies on a limited scope. So what I mean by that is everything that happens with leaked secrets is always about a specific target like a specific folder, a specific repository, or a specific directory. And the problem with this is, to start with dangling resources, some past work includes you can buy DNS data and then enumerate your cloud provider's IP pool in order to find what's dangling. So if I go ahead and create a resource over and over again in a cloud environment, I'll be assigned IP addresses that are not assigned to any other customer. And if one of these IP addresses matches a DNS record that I found in DNS data that threat intelligence providers sell, well, that's one way you can capture a dangling DNS record. And other attempts also include going after a specific target. So instead of using DNS data you buy from threat intelligence providers, you'll instead go ahead and enumerate that provider pool, but this time compare against subdomains you've enumerated for that specific provider. So, so to give you some examples, there's been a lot of work in this area. Bishop Fox originally came out in 2015 with an article where they used this passive DNS data, or at least a variant of it, in order to enumerate an AWS cloud IP pool and then capture AWS IPs that corresponded to a specific domain they were interested in. So in that case, they used Bing.com to find those dangling DNS records. Some other work includes flying a false flag from Black Hat. It's a talk where they used passive DNS data from these threat intelligence providers to determine whether IPs they captured were dangling. 
So this project was again focused on creating these backends for C2 malware platforms. They wanted to take control of legitimate domains so that they could abuse those domains for a false level of trust. And one interesting note about this project is that they noted that after releasing it, it would appear that AWS and GCP now assign IPs from a limited pool for your account. We'll touch on this more later, but this is what we're going to be focusing on when it comes to dangling DNS resources. The topic is well traversed, but what's not well traversed are the modern deterrents against it and how we can bypass them. And finally, there's still a lot of work where attackers simply enumerate your domain subdomains and then find IPs that match them. Now, when it comes to leaked secrets, the story is a bit different. It's not as well traversed as dangling DNS records at all. So, for example, there's tools that you can use to search a Git repository for these secret patterns. And even GitHub has a system where it, they'll scan every content, every piece of code uploaded to their platform for these secret patterns. But the limitation with this work is that it's really a it's very small scope. I mean, think about how much code is really going to end up on GitHub. You know, most enterprises aren't going to put their closed source applications on GitHub where this scanning would occur in the first place. Now, going on to defender approaches to mitigate these vulnerabilities, well, they've been pretty limited as well. Oftentimes, these are treated as customer vulnerabilities, which technically is correct. If you think about it from a high level, if you leak a secret or leave a DNS record dangling, that is your responsibility. But what I think that is often missed is the provider's responsibility and how they encourage these insecure defaults. So for example, tokens are really, really easy to use. Have you ever thought about how easy it is to use a token in your code? And that's how it can get leaked in the first place. Now, Fortune 500 companies might have those standard secure development lifecycle practices where they can avoid this. But in reality, a lot of small to medium-sized businesses might not understand this nuance or be able to apply it uniform across their organization. Now, this is something we're going to talk about later, but I want you to keep it in mind. Remember, even though it's a cloud customer vulnerability, there's incentives that lead to them being created in the first place. So let's talk about the traditional security mindset. Traditional bugs discovery is often centered around a specific target. You know, if I'm looking for vulnerabilities, I might go reverse engineer an application. And with dangling domains, one of the earliest approaches was going first, enumerating the subdomains of my target, and then enumerating the cloud provider IP pools in order to identify dangling resources. Now for secrets, again, we start with a specific target, whether that be a single repository or a single platform like GitHub. And what I really started to think about as I looked into this further and further was whether there's an opportunity for some vulnerabilities to be approached differently. For example, was, were we really facing tunnel vision here? Why do we need to start with a specific target? It's almost as if you know, there is a lack of focus in the industry against finding bugs at scale and rather finding bugs in individual areas. And that's what I really wanted to focus on with this research is, can we find these vulnerabilities at scale? So to expand on this, with dangling resources, the traditional mindset might include start with a target and then capture vulnerable assets. But as we've seen with past work, it can often be a lot larger than that too. For example, the security at scale approach to dangling domains would be to capture dangling assets first, and then check if there's any DNS records still pointing at them using passive DNS replication data. Now here's where it go gets interesting. For leak secrets, there's no such equivalent. You know, we have approaches to scan limited scopes for these secret patterns, but when it comes to that security at scale mindset, it still goes around a very limited target. You know, we start with a repository, a folder, a file instead of starting with a diverse data source that allows us to look for these secrets in a broad manner. So this is what I really want you to take away from this talk from a high level, is that there's an untapped potential to use unconventional data sources to find these vulnerabilities. We're about to go through some examples, but 
what I really want you to think about is not just, you know, here's how Bill applied it to dangling domains and leaked secrets, but rather how you can apply it to other types of vulnerability classes as well. This is not just about these two vulnerability classes. These two vulnerability classes are examples that you can apply to your own work. So let's talk about how we would actually implement this in practice. From a high level, we start with the vulnerability, not the target. So, and then we work backwards by using creative data sources. Remember, for dangling resources, we already have a playbook. You, can, you know a, dang, a DNS record is dangling if it points at an IP address that the customer no longer controls. How do you know if an IP is no longer controlled by a customer? Well, we can enumerate the cloud IP pool and determine every IP that we get in our attacker account is likely something that no other customer controls because that IP is assigned to us. But how do we know if it's dangling? Well, again, that passive DNS replication data. And if you're not familiar with this, how it works is that threat intelligence providers from DNS will work with DNS providers to sell this aggregate DNS traffic data. For example, you can give these threat intel providers an IP address, and they'll give you every single DNS record that points at it. Now, again, we can capture assets first with DNS records instead of starting with a target. What we'll do is we'll go through a cloud provider pool and we'll go and enumerate every IP address that we're able to get and look for DNS records that point at it. What we're going to do in the next section is apply this generic technique we've seen in past work against modern deterrence. But what about secret scanning? So this is the interesting one. This is one that we still have a lot of research to do in. We have passive DNS replication data for dangling resources. But what about leaked secrets? From a high level, the ideal data source needs to be diverse, needs to be sufficient in volume, and it needs to include a, um, a diverse set of websites, executables, you know, not just open source applications, but we need to include closed source applications too. And we need to make sure that this is done in a feasible way. For example, even if we, can, if we, even if we have a large data set of these files, we need to make sure we can scan it in a practical manner. So where can we find this large collection of apps and scripts? So what about virus scanning platforms? This is where we're, it's going to get it really interesting. So what we've seen with past work is a lot of people focusing on these platforms with limited diversity. You know, we look at GitHub, it's really going to only be open source repositories that are being scanned and automatically revoking keys. You know, we, we look at these tools, they all focus on scanning individual targets like folders, specific repos, et cetera. But what we're missing is that diverse data source. And that's what I really focused on in this research. What I found was that virus scanning platforms were actually a really interesting target because think about it. Think about all the stuff that people upload to virus scanning platforms. You know, think about all the websites that are automatically scanned, all the applications, all the mobile apps that are included in this virus total data source, and as well as other platforms. Now, with these scanning platforms, it would be infeasible to go ahead and, you know, download, what, a billion, nine billion files and each, scan each of them individually. But we don't need to do that because we can use the tools that they already provide us. Nearly every virus scanning platform lets you search for specific patterns, specific strings. Like they, they're literally spoon feeding us the perfect data source here. And traditionally, what we've used this data source for is to find malware, you know, find malicious use, et cetera. But what's really interesting about them is that what if we use secret patterns instead of malicious patterns? What if instead of looking for malware, we look for secrets instead? And with virus total, this is retro hunt, but seriously, if you look at nearly every other virus scanning platform, what you'll find is that they have a similar future, um, as, at least if you have an account. So let's apply this in practice. So with secret scanning, the plan is from a high level, we want to make sure that we look for secret patterns. And what that really means is, think about your AWS access key. I don't know if you've noticed, but it'll often start with AKIA. And what we can do is we can create these regex strings for identifying these secrets. And we can look for them using the same tools we have available for malware hunting. So most virus platforms allow you to search by a Yara rule. 
And so what we can do is we can create a Yara rule for these secret patterns, and then we can search samples uploaded to the platform for whether these patterns exist in them. Now, one thing interesting that I did in this research was also focused on validating these secrets. So I've looked at a lot of past work into leaked secrets, and what I've found is there's a lot of theoretical research that discusses things like, oh, we looked for these secret patterns, and you know, we found these unique keys, but you read into it a little deeper, and they didn't even check if those keys are legitimate. And that's something that didn't really make sense to me. There's going to be thousands and thousands and tens of thousands of keys that match a specific pattern but are not active in practice. And so what we did was that I used a platform to actually validate these keys, at least with basic metadata, and validate that they're legitimate for our use case. Now, some patterns are going to be really noisy, but if the provider doesn't make it easy to identify your, their secrets, you're going to find that you're going to have to scan thousands and thousands of secret patterns in thousands of thousands of files. So how do we deal with this large volume? Well, what I did to do it on my budget, remember I'm doing this everything out of pocket, was leverage serverless computing. So I, don't, I needed a capacity of having several physical server racks, but I don't have money to buy several physical server racks. Instead, I can rent them using the cloud. And what that really means is I made a serverless function in order to scan these files. And I also made a serverless function to validate the keys that were found. And this way, I don't actually have to pay that much because I only pay for what I use. In practice, my costs were actually fairly reasonable for an individual. Now for dangling resources, again, the methodology from a high level was to reallocate resources over and over and over again. And then it was to cross-check them with passive DNS replication data. Remember, this isn't necessarily new, but what's interesting about them is that we're going to be talking about bypassing modern deterrence. And what I mean by that is a lot of cloud providers have implemented these mitigations to make it harder to do this dangling DNS record enumeration, and we're going to bypass them. So from a high level, one thing I want to call out is that earlier no. Remember, it would appear that AWS began serving elastic IPs from a small, specific pool similar to GCP. This severely limits the diversity of addresses received. And so let me tell you what this really means in practice. So what, what's going on here is that AWS and GCP have a mitigation where when you are asked to assign me an IP address, whether that be an Elastic IP or in GCP case, nearly every resource that you can get, go ahead and allocate that needs an IP, these cloud providers will only give you a specific set of IPs for, assigned to a shared pool that's limited to your account and maybe a few others. And for AWS, this is going to be largely Elastic IP sharing. So that means whenever you ask for a dedicated Elastic IP, you'll notice if you free an Elastic IP and allocate another one, you're going to be assigned the same one over and over again. Or in general, it's really hard to actually enumerate that pool using Elastic IPs alone. Now, with AWS, they also introduced a mitigation, I don't know if it's intentionally to go against dangling DNS enumeration, but they did introduce a mitigation in 2024 where every IP address you received was actually had an increased surcharge. So now every IP you got allocated cost you extra money. And this deters attacks by making it more expensive to enumerate their public IP pools and capture these dangling DNS records. Now for, Go now for Google Cloud, it's interesting. They actually had quite a lot more than I expected. So for project levels, so every account can have about 15, 10 to 15 projects assigned to them. By default, you can request an increase, but you need justification. Now, IPs are, again, assigned from a small pool just like AWS. Um, you only have eight IPs you can use by default in per region and globally. And with these accounts, you also had something called a billing account restriction. So with Google Cloud, every credit card can be created into a billing account. Now, you can create a few billing accounts based off of one credit card, but if you try to create more than a few, you'll automatically hit their suspension, and you'll have to go justify why are you creating a 50th you know, credit card account or billing account with one credit card. And so all of these deterrents really make it difficult for attackers to enumerate these dangling domains. In fact, with Google Cloud, while managed DNS enumeration was always a thing and has been for the past few years, 
Attackers haven't been able to enumerate Google Cloud's public IP pools for quite some time, at least none research that I could find online. So with those AWS mitigations, they're actually pretty simple to bypass. Instead of allocating Elastic IPs, we can just restart EC2 instances with ephemeral IPs, and we can perform the enumeration by just restarting, 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 and my IP address that my EC2 IP, EC2 instance is assigned, will generally rotate a lot faster through unique IPs than if you tried with Elastic IPs. In fact, um, I actually was able to enumerate nearly 2.4 million unique IP addresses in a span of six months by using this methodology. Now with Google Cloud, again, they had a harder set of mitigations, but they, those mitigations were deterrents. So how it worked was that I used a backend bucket with a load balancer in order to assign IP addresses to my resources. But this still didn't let me get past these cloud resource restrictions. How do we do that? Well, once we have this primitive for enumerating cloud IPs, we can talk about those limitations. But for high level information, we used forwarding rules instead of virtual machines in order to enumerate these IPs. So with Google Cloud, remember all those restrictions? Well, we can actually bypass all of them fairly cheaply. So number one, with a billing account, one interesting thing I found was that you can assign billing accounts across Google accounts. This was a useful primitive where if I could create a billing account in one account, I can actually assign it across several accounts. And, and the reason this is interesting is, well, what about those quotas? Well, with account quotas, remember you can only create a certain amount of projects. Now again, you can, requ you can request an increase in this limit, but you don't wanna have to do this justification. I felt that it would be inappropriate to assume that an attacker would be able to get this quota increase. What I found was though, you can create a Google Workspace environment. So what that means is I can create a fake business.com, I can create Google Workspace environment for it, and then I can create practically as many Google accounts as I want um, for about $6 per account per month. And this way, each of those accounts gets a dedicated quota limit and allows you to bypass these quota limits by creating, for example, 10 accounts. Now that's $60, but now your quota has been 10 timed. And finally, to bypass virtual billing account restrictions, remember those credit card restrictions, billing accounts can only be associated with a number of, certain number of projects. Well, we can instead then use virtual credit cards. And I use privacy.com, that's not a recommendation, it's just one of the easiest that worked for me. And what really this means is, it's not like they're bypassing KYC practices, they verified my identity, but it still allows me to create as many credit card numbers as I want, and be able to create as many billing accounts as I want to be able to bypass every single restriction we discuss with Google Cloud. And so this is what I really want to like mention from a high level, is Google Cloud implemented all these deterrents to try to make sure you can't enumerate their dangling IPs, but in practice, these deterrents weren't addressing the root cause, which was the fact that the dangling IPs still existed in the first place. So let's talk about a little bit of the discovery process and what I was able to find with these techniques. So with dangling resources, I was able to enumerate over two million IP addresses for Google Cloud and AWS. These are unique IP addresses um, and they're mostly primitive resources. So these IPs were created by, remember, re restarting an EC2 instance or creating forwarding rules over and over again. As far as I'm aware, this is one of the first methodologies to successfully bypass every single Google Cloud deterrent that is intended to stop this type of attack in the first place. I captured over 60,000 unique, fully qual qualified domain names, and this reflects past research into this area where it's researchers found that these FQDNs, there are a lot of different A records that pointed at IPs that were no longer being controlled. Now out of these 60,000 FQDNs, there are about 54,000 unique second level domains. And what that really means is that once you take away the subdomain, let's say a.b.com, we're just focusing on the unique number of apex or second level domains, well, that was over 54,000. And finally, one of over 5,000 of the domains that I was able to capture included, were included in the Trenco top 1 million list. So Trenco is a listing of every domain that they're aware of within a certain ranking, and it allows you to compare what 
uh, it's supposed to be an objective metric for a ranking of a domain based on DNS data. Now, there are a lot of Fortune 500 companies impacted, and what I found really interesting was that with AWS, we had a roughly 25, um, a rate of 25 dangling domains per thousand IPs, but with Google Cloud, it was nearly 36. And so what I suspect this di discrepancy is as a result of is that Google Cloud hasn't been able to be enumerated for quite a few years. Now, this talk isn't going to focus on the actual impact against customers because I promised DEF CON review board I wouldn't get stuck on it. But you can see that I was able to compromise some of the world's largest organizations, including the Western District Court of Texas, um, the New York Times, uh, the Californ go State Government of California, and Dior. And um, yeah, it was a pretty fun time. There was a lot more examples here. Again, this isn't intended to cover it. That's uh, on a separate blog post as well. I'll really go into detail about the impact. And for secret scanning, again, what was really interesting was that I scanned over 5 million unique files for, from various platforms, not just VirusTotal, that was just one of them. Um, and I discovered over 15,000 validated secrets. And out of these secrets, they included to over 2,500 unique, again, validated. These aren't just, you know, may match a pattern. These are validated to over 2,500 validated secrets, over 2,400 unique AWS keys, over 2,200 GitHub personal access tokens and fine-grained tokens, over 600 Google Cloud service accounts, over 460 Stripe accounts, and the rest are largely from miscellaneous providers added up together that I didn't feel the need to include in this slide. And and again, there will be a blog to recap this, but from a high level, it's some of the largest organizations in the world were impacted. You know, just a fun example a few months ago was Slack, Stanford's entire Slack workspace, um, Samsung's workspace for Bigsby. I was able to get a bot token for this Samsung Bigsby tenant, and which allowed me to read messages from nearly every channel, every single channel that the bot had access to because of a default scope that was quite broad. You know, some other interesting things included the Supreme Court of Nebraska, that was a fun one, where they uploaded a password list to VirusTotal with like 300 credentials from different, like, I don't know, different AWS providers, different cloud providers, their security solutions, et cetera. That was a really fun one. Um, you know, there are database backups with a lot of these AWS keys that had broad access to S3 buckets. Anyways, you'll be able to read a lot more about this this following week. So by leveraging a security at scale mindset, we can help protect thousands of organizations far beyond a limited scope. Remember, instead of starting with a specific target, by starting with a diverse data set, we were able to have a much wider impact than any of past work into leaked secrets. You can read more about some of this impact in an, in an article that should be released right now uh, by Matt Burgess from Wired. And I'll be releasing a detailed technical blog later this week once I figure out whether a certain cloud provider can actually revoke some of these keys or not. So bringing it all together. Hard coding, hard coding secrets is the path of least resistance. So remember, these are customer vulnerabilities, but what enables them is these bad incentives. Think about it. Think about how easy it is to go ahead and generate an AWS access key or generate a Google Cloud service account and then put that into your executable directly. You know, the libraries for these different providers allow this direct interface in the first place. Now, the reason this is really important is because a lot of developers are going to follow the path of least resistance, especially from smaller to mid-cap businesses. And with dangling DNS records, the same problem exists. It's the path of least resistance. I create an AWS EC2 instance. I put my DNS record pointing at that AWS EC2 instance. And the path of least resistance is leaving that DNS record, even if I deallocate it. And what I think we need to really focus on is making sure that the path of least resistance is the secure path. And what this really means is with dangling resources, I think we need to have better ownership 
of cloud resources and DNS records, better association. So for example, some cloud providers have tried to associate their DNS services with their EC2 resources as one example. Um, and the problem with this is a lot of different customers are going to use different DNS providers, different cloud providers. What we really need is an industry-wide solution of tracking DNS records and tracking cloud resources and putting them together. Now, for hard-coded secrets, what I really think we need to focus on is making sure that it's hard to include secrets in your code. So don't have short access tokens that your library just blindly accepts from a string. But instead, for it, All right, thank you for that. That was a nice uh, wake up call. Um, <laughs> all right, uh, anyways, so yeah, with these hard coded secrets, what I really think we need to do is make sure to limit the secrets so that they can only be inserted from the environment or from a file on disk and make it hard to hard code these secrets inside of an executable in the first place. Now again, you can have exceptions, you know, you can have it so a customer can opt out from the secure default but we need to make sure that the secret default is secure. So what about remediating, the, remediating these vulnerabilities? Well, remember, for dangling records at a high level, it's going to be hard to contact every single host of every 60,000 dangling domain that I was able to discover. What we really need is a way to tie ownership to DNS records. And we need to do this across the industry because of that multi-cloud approach. Now for secrets, this is where it gets really interesting. So I went ahead and asked a bunch of organizations that I found secrets for, including GitHub, including AWS, including OpenAI, whether I could report secrets to them and they could revoke them automatically. Now GitHub has that program for scanning secrets on their platform already. Remember, if you actually go ahead and post a, for example, OpenAI access key on a public repository, that access key will be revoked within a few minutes. And what I was curious was, hey, GitHub, can I please use this mechanism you already have? Well, unfortunately, they said no. Um, and in fact, several providers said no, like AWS, despite the fact that they already had given this mechanism to GitHub, and despite the fact that an attacker could access the mechanism by posting a public git or public commit. Now, one exception to this was OpenAI, who immediately responded with an endpoint for reporting these keys and allowed me to automatically revoke the keys that I discovered in the wild. But what do we do about everyone else? So the problem with these secret keys is that the impact is far, far, far greater than dangling DNS records. In fact, we just saw some of the world's largest organizations, and there were several more impacted. I didn't feel comfortable releasing this work without at least some stopgap until these cloud providers could take the secure default. So what I actually did was I developed a mechanism that used GitHub's mechanism anyway for d revoking these secrets because um, they said no, but I, I don't care. Um, but uh, yeah, so what I did was I, I have this system now where whenever new secrets are discovered, um, I'll go ahead and create a gist and the way I create this gist is by um, automating the entire GitHub login process and then just in, um, using an UI endpoint for creating a public gist. And this way, it'll actually trigger um, the GitHub secret scanning mechanism that they could have given me direct access to anyway. So yeah, anyways. Now what's really cool about this is that every, almost every secret that you saw listed in the previous section a lot of them are going to be revoked. There's an exception to that, though. One of the largest providers which did have leaked secrets was AWS. Now, AWS takes an interesting approach. When you post your AWS access key on a public GitHub commit or post, what they do is that they'll create a support case for you and restrict right access using that key. Now, I found that kind of interesting. So what that's really happening is AWS is aware of these secret keys but they're choosing not to revoke them for some reason. Um, yeah, that's an interesting one. So effectively, if you find a leaked AWS access key on GitHub, 
you can still use that key to read S3 buckets, read RDS database data, to read download files from S3. You know, I, I remember I looked at a uh, AWS key last weekend for a casino that ha was dealing, well, alleged to deal with over $1 billion uh, of bets a month. And I was like, okay, wait a minute. Was this reported? We should get this revoked. But in reality, what happened was AWS created this support case. The customer never saw it because the support email was sent to their generic billing account. You know, a lot of people, a lot of enterprises set up an AWS account and use a generic billing email that no one really looks at. And so the support case was ignored, and this key is still active today. You know, it's disappointing because I don't know what, else, what more I can do for my shoes. You know, I've created a mechanism that can help automatically revoke most of these keys, but what do we do about keys that the provider doesn't take action on? And so this is where I really think providers need to switch up is, number one, if someone ha someone's seeker key, you have both components, is on the internet and you know about it, you need to revoke that immediately. I mean, it's crazy to me to think that even on GitHub, if you post your AWS access key, that's not going to be automatically revoked. Every other provider I looked at does automatically revoke. Google Cloud revokes, Slack revokes, OpenAI revokes. The largest cloud provider by market share does not revoke. Now, if you're interested in starting this, starting this sort of research yourself, what I'd focus on is breaking down the traditional methods of finding vulnerabilities. So with dangling domains, that was checking if the DNS record is actually pointing at a uncaptured IP address. And with secrets, it was trying to find those secret patterns in a diverse data source. So in this case, we used virus scanning platforms, but you can use a similar methodology against a, lot, a larger set of vulnerability classes. And what you really want to do is correlate those steps with these large data sets, regardless of their intended usage. Thank you so much for coming out to this talk. What a fun time. We do have a few minutes for questions. Oh, we apparently don't have microphones. That's, that's funny. All right, yeah. If you have questions, feel free to come up uh, and we can have a chat over on stage. Thank you so much for coming out to this talk. What a fun time. And yeah, I look forward to working with these providers to address these vulnerabilities.